Welcome to episode 17 of the Going for Broke Outdoors podcast, a podcast by an outdoorsman for other outdoorsmen. I'm your host, Jeremy Gillespie. In today's episode, we catch up with Garrett Prawl. Garrett is the man behind the extremely popular DIY Sportsman YouTube channel and podcast. In today's episode, Garrett and I discuss why he first started filming and sharing content. We also discuss the evolution of his camera gear, what cameras he would recommend at various budgets, and what he currently uses to film his own hunting adventures. The conversation then shifts to hunting out of state, Garrett's lessons learned there, and one of his big takeaways from hunting out of state, which is adapting to hunter pressure. We close out the podcast discussing one of Garrett's latest videos where he discusses the effects of various stabilizer setups on his bow accuracy. I really enjoyed my conversation with Garrett and the opportunity to discuss some of these topics and get Garrett's analytical perspective. Quick note, in this podcast, we cover a lot of gear-related content, and I've included links to some of the gear discussed in the podcast description for reference. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, please share with a friend or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or on my YouTube channel. Today's podcast is brought to you by Stealth Outdoors at www.stealthoutdoors.com. Visit the Stealth Outdoor store to outfit your mobile hunting setup with some silencing gear. There's not a better product on the market for eliminating unwanted noise. Stealth Outdoors manufactures an incredibly durable product and at a great value. Designed with the mobile hunter in mind, Stealth Outdoors manufactures climbing stick wraps, cam buckle covers, platform cable wraps, and stealth strip rolls for all of your miscellaneous silencing needs. Head on over to www.stealthoutdoors.com to place your order today. Now, on to the podcast. All right, on the phone today, we've got Garrett Prawl, also known as the DIY Sportsman. Garrett, thanks for taking the time out of your schedule to join me on the podcast today, and how are you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, appreciate it, man. For anyone who's listening that isn't familiar with Garrett, Garrett runs an extremely popular YouTube channel called The DIY Sportsman that currently has over 63,000 subscribers. And Garrett, that's where I'd like to start out today's discussion. I've checked out your channel several times in the past, and I'm a really big fan of your no-nonsense presentation style. And in preparation for this podcast, I actually went back and looked at your oldest video, and it looks like you posted your first video approximately nine years ago. So the first thing I want to discuss today is what prompted you to start recording video content and posting it to YouTube in the first place? Yeah, great question. Originally, this, this was like pre-monetization on YouTube. Pretty much it was a sharing site when I first started like creating account and uploading videos. And I, I want to say even before I had a YouTube channel per se, I was still trying to upload videos to at least just share on the forums. I mean, back at that time frame, forums were a pretty big you know, much more popular maybe than they even are now, you know, kind of that pre-social media phase. And, and so I was pretty, pretty involved in a lot of deer hunting forums and self-filming was pretty big with a few of the guys on there. So it was something that I wanted to try to be able to, you know, perhaps make myself better um, in, in terms of being able to like look at the, the shots on film, uh, add that additional bit of challenge, but also be able to kind of share those experiences and learnings with other people uh, without really much aspirations at all. And so some of those first videos, I don't even think I have on my channel anymore. Some of the original ones that I would share on the forums, but eventually I started to take it a little bit more seriously, invested in a, a slightly more expensive camera, which uh, by today's standards still wasn't that, that high end and started to add different styles of videos that were not necessarily just hunting, but also, you know, gear or how to or DIY related. Yeah, and I'm sure you've learned a ton of lessons from your YouTube journey, but can you tell me some of your biggest surprises you've had along the way from your uh, initially creating your channel until today? I think some of the, the biggest surprises that I've probably had, is there's been times where I've thought about posting videos or content that I had and just didn't think that there would be much of an audience or appetite for it, especially on the side of things where, were more explaining or just kind of showcasing a hunt that maybe wasn't successful. And I think maybe TV hunting has taught us this, but you, you're you led to believe at some point that you need to have a successful shot on film. You need to have a successful hunt. You better make sure it's in frame, you know, all these sort of things. Uh, the video should be nice, quick to the point. And, you know, it, it kind of has that neat, tiny little package that we're all, kind of accustomed to seeing growing up watching it on, uh, on you know, the outdoor channel or sportsman's channel or whatever. And 
over time, just kind of learning and watching and observing other people having success, kind of you know, teaching people different things that might not necessarily fly with like a, a TV style of production. Uh, you know, like guys like the hunting public come to mind where you got videos that are entertaining to watch, even if nothing really happens in terms of the kill shot at the end. And people can learn from that as well as having that entertainment value. So that's kind of a big learning for me. And then I started, you know, figuring it, I could adapt that style to some of you know what I do. And, and I, of course I don't do everything that they do, but in kind of my own style, I have posted and created content on things that I ne- didn't necessarily think would, you know, be something people would really get a whole lot out of, uh, right? Like let's take that the most recent stabilizer video I did. You know, five years ago, ten years ago, I might not have felt that that was, you know, entertaining enough for somebody to want to watch. Uh, but my my views on that sort of thing have changed, and really, there's a lot of different ways that you can create a video that's going to have value to people to watch. Yeah, I want to touch on a few things you said there. Uh, first, and this is from personal experience. So, my friend, and you might know him from the forum, uh, T. Buno on the forum, Tim Buno is, is his name. Yep. So we did an antelope hunt last year and we were lucky enough to get almost all of it on film. And part of the deal was I was hiding like 50 yards away from Tim and Tim was behind one of those. uh, Are you familiar with the stalker decoys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Tim had a a stalker decoy on his tripod and had his camera set up. Well, as he drew the antelope walked out of frame and he, he had never shot one. So of course he's going to shoot, right? We're, we're still very much at the point of experience over, get a perfectly filmed hunt and to to your point we received very little and when i say very little i mean almost no negative feedback like why didn't you have the shot on film i I think people understand and like you said we've been conditioned to think that everything's got to be hollywood perfect but there's still as you alluded to uh especially when there's like lessons or teaching there's still an appetite for that kind of content even if it's not 100 percent polished yeah. And I think if a guy wants to make a nice polished product and that's what their, their goal is, and that's what, that's, what's going to make their experience, you know, worthwhile of bringing that camera equipment in, then you know, that's awesome too. Um, but like I said, it's, it's almost like you can, you can chase one just kind of knowing that you're going to have trade-offs one way or the other. If I go to make a polished production, then I might not be as likely to get that shot opportunity and, and punch that tag vice versa. If I, prioritize punching the tag i might just be willing to put up with the fact that i might might not get pristine footage all the time yeah or in my case this year no footage at all but that's a whole nother story (laughs) (laughs) so one of the other things you mentioned in your answer there and i want to touch on this because i think this is important too and, and it probably happens naturally but you mentioned developing your own style so maybe talk a little bit about that how how has your style developed over the last several years I think for the most part, I try to think about my videos in the context of, you know, is there something that could be learned from this? It's pretty obvious when you think about something like a tree stand hanging video, for instance. Uh, people that are newer to hunting saw value in that. Uh, people who have been doing it for a long time maybe had not, unless there's some little trick that they hadn't been doing that now they implemented. But other things that might be not as obvious, I still try to see if there's some way that I can put a different spin on it or add some of my background that might be a little bit of a a technical insight if it's applicable for that style of video and try and add a lot of detail where it's necessary and where it makes sense, but then also try to make that, you know, somewhat uh, condensed and digestible. So it's not just a long droning on video that's boring for everybody to watch if it is a more technical type of thing. Yeah. And that's one of the things uh, I'm, very level one, you know, for, on a one to, te- one to 10 scale, I'm still very level one at making videos. But one of the things that I found out right away is I don't shoot nearly enough B-roll to, to have cutaways during the video because I think people um, in general have, for video, relatively short attention span. So you want to keep like the video images moving, even if the, yep. even if the monologue's the same. So that was one of my first lessons that I definitely learned. Yeah, for sure. It, it definitely... We like the old adage, always, you know, film more than you think you're going to need so that you're, you know, you'd rather be able to not use clips that you had than not have enough clips to really tell the story. Um, there's been plenty of times where I've been out in the woods and I finish a hunt and I just want to go home. I don't want to do an exit interview or whatever. And 
and then I'll have three, four days like that. And then the fifth day I go out in the hunt and I, I kill the deer within the first five minutes and don't really have much of a story to tell there. It's like, man, if I would have just been kind of taking additional bits and pieces along the way, it would have been a little bit easier to, to give the setup. And especially in the audio side of things, if you have good audio, then you can tell you're in the tree, you know, interview and be able to tell the full story, but it's not just going to be the camera looking at your face the whole time, which even if the story you're trying to tell is good, it's so easy for people to lose their attention span there. You're just overlaying that with clips of B-roll that helps illustrate what you're saying. Then it's, it just makes it a lot more digestible. I feel like for the viewer. And, and I think we see that more and more with some of the, um, the productions that are getting pretty popular. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, a great transition into the, the next question. You've already given a bunch of great tips, but it seems like everybody and their brother, myself included, is doing something on YouTube these days. You have obviously um, figured out a formula that works very well for you and has attracted a, a big and loyal following. So give me like, like your top three tips. If someone is starting out right now, things that you wish you knew when you started out initially. So the biggest thing, like you mentioned, is I think finding some place where you're going to stand out. You know, if you if you want to try and make a channel that is sort of loosely or tightly based off of a different channel that has been successful and you want to try to, I guess, mirror their production, then you have to be really good at that type of thing and be able to, like, if you're going to truly try to replicate it, you know, verbatim, you're going to have to have almost better content uh, than them to really kind of try and make a name for yourself. Whereas if you have a little bit of your own unique thing, whatever that might be, then it becomes a little bit easier for you to make content, I guess, in your own style, um, or at least one little piece that makes it unique to, to what you do. And that makes you, I guess, more brandable, more recognizable, rather than, you know, just new faces on the same video that somebody has seen before, which can be really hard to do, especially if you have, you know, people that have influenced you, and that helps guide your videos. I think that there's nothing wrong with trying to imitate others um it was much easier to start channels i feel like five ten years ago before the there's as many channels as there are now for instance um to be able to, to do successful now i think you have to either have something that's you know very unique to yourself number one or you just have to have a really good way to create a whole lot of good content which is much easier said than done uh, especially if you have other activities that are you know fulfilling your your daily lives yeah, so what I heard there to paraphrase you is basically I am doomed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not necessarily true, um, but I, I feel like it's yeah, it's, it's I'd say it's harder now than it, than it probably ever has been. Uh, and I mean, I watch I watch videos too from other industries. You know, outside of hunting, I'll I'll watch a lot of camera videos, and uh, you if, if you're trying to watch like a camera review video, it's almost like these companies will. They'll send out the review unit, you know, prior to the actual launch and then people get all their videos ready. And then once the, uh, the launch date hits and the, you know, NDAs or whatever are lifted, and it's like everybody's review video hits at the exact same time. And if there's some little, you know, bitter piece of information or, or style that you like from one camera review channel over the other ones, that's when you're going to watch. So it might not necessarily be that one is better than the other, but it might be one that you like more. And usually the way to, to have a video that is likable is to, you know, make it somewhat of your own. When I was getting into filming, I was watching a ton of camera review videos, and, and you're probably familiar with the guy. I believe it's Gerald Undone. He's got a really good video uh, camera review channel. Yeah. Yeah, I love watching Gerald Undone. And what makes him unique is he's the tech guy. Right? Like if you want to figure out the nuts and bolts behind something, you watch Gerald Undone. But if you want to watch a video that actually gives you some, like, really practical information for in the field usability for a dummy and also some humor. You'd watch somebody like camera conspiracies, like totally different styles, but they, they're both entertaining to watch in their own right. Um, so it, it just goes to show like you can have your own style and, and still kind of grow into that and be successful. Yeah. And obviously while we're on the topic, something that goes hand in hand with YouTube is obviously camera equipment. So let's discuss the evolution of your personal camera gear. I believe it's, Fair to say you have a reputation as a tinkerer. So I'd like to discuss kind of your initial camera gear. Like you said, when you first got started and then you upgraded, maybe what you were using four years ago, 
and then discuss your current setup and and I believe you're using multi, multiple cameras now, so maybe touch on why you selected those cameras and what function they serve for you. Yep. Initially, I started off with just one camera, no additional second angles or anything like that, and just a basic camera arm. I think at the time it was the normal strong arm, but camera-wise, I honestly can't remember the first one. It was either a JVC or a Panasonic or something, little handy cam that ran a mini DV tape, and... I'm sure it's like VCRs. If you try to buy one now, you'd have to do a bunch of workarounds to even get usable footage out of it. But I very quickly moved on to a Sony, or excuse me, if it wasn't a Sony, it was a Canon, uh, HF S100, one of their Vixia models. And that was a more reasonably priced option. I think it was, you know, maybe three or $400. But it gave me a little bit more visibility into kind of the manual control. I was able to do more things than I could on just a really basic, like $150, $200 uh, Walmart, you know, JVC camera. And so that allowed me to also plug in, I believe, a, you know, some sort of a remote uh, as well as a external microphone, both of, both of which made self filming, you know, quite, uh, quite a bit easier and better audio for sure. And that combo allowed me to do a whole lot of what I wanted to do. And, and really even by today's standards, it's not all that outdated. Um, you could still buy something like that if you can find one and still be able to get pretty usable footage quality out of it. Uh, but eventually I did upgrade from that to kind of that more, you know, middle of my filming career type of a camera, which was the the Sony higher end camcorders. Uh, I went back and forth between the Sony AX53, the AX100, and the AX700. They are all kind of similar. The 100 and 700 being a little bit more prosumer, a little bit more manual controls and buttons, a little bit larger sensor whereas the 53 had a better zoom range and also a better um, stabilization, but a little bit worse in low light. And those just like the old uh, Canon did allowed me to use external microphones. They gave me options. The stability was good. The video quality was better. I was able to start filming in 4K, uh, which made a, a pretty big difference, especially from a cell filming perspective. And I started to add action cameras. Uh, so the, the Sony X3000 was one that I had used quite a bit. And I actually still have that one as well. And I feel like even even by today's standards, that one's a good, like you can find it used AX53. That's a pretty good starter camera. Uh, it's still somewhat expensive, even though the use price probably for some guys. They could probably, I would imagine, find one for you know the $500 range or so that you can add to your accessories. But it, it'll do a great job. And I even know some big YouTube channels on the hunting side of things that still use that particular camcorder for all their filming pretty much. And then most recently, uh, and this one still kind of hurts the, the wallet a little bit. I <laughs> upgraded to a Sony a seven S three, which is their newer flagship video mirrorless camera. Oh yeah. People have been waiting on that thing for years. Yeah, it was a, it was five years they take them from the Mark II to the Mark III. Uh, but the, I mean, it pretty much, it had really lofty expectations from consumers just because of how long it took. And they pretty much exceeded all of those expectations, which is really remarkable that they're able to pull something like that off. Uh, but that camera will film in, you know, beautiful 4K, 120 frames per second, 240 frames per second slow motion. Um, the sensor is enormous and the sensitivity is on a whole other level to where the camera will see much better in low light than your human eye can. So that pretty much eliminates all of your low light filming issues. Um, it's, it's a heavier and it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more to figure out. It's not quite as you know, intuitive as a camcorder would be. There's no built in ND filters. Uh, it's not as easy to hook up a remote to it, but the aesthetic that you're able to get with that big sensor is, is something that's a bit unique as well. And if you were a guy that was looking to get into more of the filming, like a filmic um, style of videos, then a mirrorless camera in general, the bigger sensor and various interchangeable lenses is kind of going to give you that aesthetic more so than anything else. And so I just kind of bit the bullet. I was looking at probably two or three different models, like various price ranges and decided, you know, this might be the camera that I buy and just continue to use for the next five years. Uh, so I went ahead and made that purchase. Be able to get great photos with it as well. So it's nice that I only have to bring in that one main camera plus uh, additional action cameras, uh, which 
Usually I'm using a 360 camera as a second angle now. And is that a GoPro or is that a different brand? Uh, Insta360 is the brand that I use. Guys, I want to take a quick break from the podcast to talk to you about BackwoodsMobileGear.com. Backwoods Mobile Gear produces an array of products to completely customize your mobile hunting setup. Backwoods Mobile Gear's product line includes climbing aiders like their multi-step aider and verse aider. Climb higher using the same amount of climbing sticks with climbing aiders at a fraction of the weight of an additional climbing stick. Backwoods Mobile Gear also offers a variety of Amsteel rope solutions from daisy chains for climbing sticks to Amsteel gear hangers. Replace those bulky straps and hunt ruining metal cam buckles with buckleless and lightweight amp steel products from Backwoods Mobile Gear. Check out Backwoods Mobile Gear at www.backwoodsmobilegear.com if you want your setup to be lighter, to take you higher, and to keep your gear tighter. Okay. Well, I've, uh, uh, first of all, appreciate the in depth explanation on kind of evolution of your camera gear and a few follow up questions that are coming out of that. And the, the first thing I'll say is, I'm familiar with the Sony AX line. That's actually what I use. I've got an AX700, which uh, getting into filming, I did quite a bit of research, and I felt like a camcorder was a better option for me initially than a mirrorless, like you said, because there's a lot more manual controls. Some of the stuff's more difficult to integrate as far as the remote and the microphones and stuff. But one of the things when I got started, uh, and I am not tech savvy, I understand that you are, so I didn't understand necessarily what the different resolutions meant or the different frame rates so I'd like you to discuss resolution, kind of like resolution for dummies, which would be myself included, and then frame rates and kind of what your default settings are and when and why you would use different frame rates or different resolutions. Sure. So if you think back to old standard def- definition tele- television, you would often have resolutions that were, we call like uh, a 540p which is your your vertical resolution, how many pixels you have in that vertical line top to bottom of the the screen. And so pretty much every TV that you probably would have watched growing up was probably around that resolution. And HD, which is 1080 vertical pixels, the the full resolution being 1920 by 1080, was like that next big thing. And so you got significantly more pixel resolution by switching from a standard definition to a high definition. And from the high definition, you jumped up to 4K uh, was the big thing. So kind of a difference in the nomenclature there. But the 4K is around, it's close to 4,000 horizontal pixels. So the actual number is 3840 by 2160. And you, so you have really over twice the pixels in both the horizontal and the vertical direction. So it's, it's you know pretty much four times the total number of pixels that you have in even an HD image so resolution wise 4k is significantly more than 1080 you know full hd which is significantly more than the old standard definition most camcorders won't even in standard definition is not really even an option on a lot of them now you think it's hd or 4k and i think from a a self-filming perspective especially 4k if you can get a camera that has 4k is going to be the way to go typically uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I feel like if you're going to film in 4K and I end up exporting your video in full HD, which is what I typically do. I don't upload my videos usually in 4K, but on YouTube, you really can't tell much of a difference oftentimes. That downsampling will actually make, in some cases, your image look a little bit better by cramming all those 4K pixels down into a, a smaller full HD. Uh, but the other piece of it is that you can be a little bit more zoomed out and you have a little bit more flexibility because of all those pixels to crop your image in a little bit and it'll still look pretty good. So instead of having to zoom in to get a nice tight frame shot and then have to worry about that animal walking out of the frame with 4K, you can keep it a little bit more zoomed out and then you can just crop that image in in editing to reframe and then get your nice, you know, rule of thirds and everything else. And so from that perspective, the 4K is, is definitely, I think, the way to go. Some computers, depending on what you have, might struggle a little bit more with, with 4K footage versus 1080. But we're getting to the point more and more where if you have a semi-recent computer, it should be able to handle a basic 4K image without too much of an issue. Uh, some of those files on like that A7S III and the high bit rate, maybe a different story. I can get a little bit of your machine to be able to handle something like that. But most of those files from 4K cameras are 
you know, I, I guess to, to put it simply, 4K is probably the way to go unless you have a reason not to film in 4K. Yeah, and to elaborate on the point a little bit, and again, this is coming from a layman's perspective, is when you said a TV used to be roughly 540 pixels you know, vertically, and for the same unit of measurement is how I like to think about it. So if the screen size r- remains the same in 4K, you've got you know, wh- whatever it turns out to be, what is it, four or eight times as many pixels per the same unit of measurement, correct? Yep. Yes, you, you could fit, you could fit uh, a standard definition sensor, just like number of pixels, and you could fit 16 of those on a 4K sensor. So 16 times more pixels. And, and what Garrett's talking about is, is especially useful for editing is because you can leave your camera on a much wider field of view and then you can edit in whatever your editing software is. And when you zoom in, you're still going to have, in many cases, at least 1080p. Or even if you had a really wide zoom, you could zoom in and still have like old school standard definition. And you don't have to worry so much about keeping the focus in the animal right in full frame. Yeah. And the other thing you can do, too, is if you have just kind of a monotonous like monologue or something where you're talking into the camera, and you, you forgot to get enough B-roll to make it interesting. You can just take that image and just punch in by 50% and then punch back out and then punch back in just to make it seem like you're cutting in and cutting away uh, to add a little bit of dynamic here to that otherwise static shot. Do you watch Jevin Dovey ever on YouTube? I, I don't think so. Okay, so he's another guy I was watching when I was watching a lot of camera reviews, and he does a lot of monologue stuff when he's explaining products. And he does B-roll too, obviously, but that was one of his tricks was to do the, the 50% zoom in, 50% zoom out. And that was how he actually edits out any mistakes he makes, like in a, mo- in a monologue. That's what he uses yep. as a transition is like that zoom in, zoom out. So that's a pretty handy trick too. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, one additional trick is when you, when you punch in, make sure that your subject is in the exact same spot. So like I'll take one of my eyeballs and I'll just hold my mouse over that. And when I punch in the 50%, I'll be like, oh, when I did that, you know, my face moved a little bit left and up relative to where it was before. And I'll just move that you know, reframe that image so that the, the eyeball is in the same spot. And then when you punch back in and punch back out, it looks way more natural than if you just punch in and, and don't do anything else. Yeah, and those are the type of tips I think that you learn or the experience you gain over time that, that kind of starts setting your videos apart. Yep. All right, perfect. Well, one other thing, uh, you, you covered resolution really well. We... And I ask a lot of questions within questions, so that's my fault. But can you touch on frame rate? What's your default frame rate? And why would someone use a frame rate other than, you know, whatever the default is? Sure. I'd say the most common one is 30 frames per second. Most of the internet that we watch and TV production is going to be in 30 frames per second. So we're used to looking at that. Movies and, and cinema films, on the other hand, are more commonly filmed in 24 frames per second. It gives a little bit of a different aesthetic, a little bit more motion blur. So for people who are making films, usually they'll film in 24, otherwise 30 is definitely the most common. And it's still a pretty good number for giving you good low light performance. You can film in higher frame rates, especially if you want to go and present it in slow motion. If you film something in 60 frames per second, then you can slow it down 50% and it'll basically play back at half speed, but still look good. And same thing if you record it in 120 frames per second, you can slow it down to 25% and it'll still play back smoothly. The downside is that in order to get that smooth playback, when you're filming in a higher frame rate, your camera actually needs to run at a shorter shutter speed. It's letting in less light per frame. And because of that, your low light performance is not going to be as good as when you're filming in that basic 30. So, One way you could do that if you're filming out in the woods and you want the option to film in slow motion is you can film most of your hunt in like a 4K60 if your camera has it or a 1080 But then once it gets down to kind of lower light, evening, you just go ahead and put that over to a 30 frame per second mode. On my A7S3, I pretty much run everything at 4K60 because that camera's low light is good enough that even at 4K60, all the way down to legal shooting light. I don't have any issues letting light in. Uh, and if I want to film something that is, I, I know I want it to be slow motion, I'll film it in the 4K 120. Um, that's much harder for my computer to edit. 
So I don't, I only use it if I know I'm going to slow something down and I'm just film everything in 4K 120. Um, but that seems to be a pretty good mix for what I'm doing currently. Yeah, that's a great explanation. And and when I was learning about frame rate too, again, I didn't understand anything because I'm a tech layman, but I, I think about frame rate now almost like resolution. Like you said, you can uh, you can slow down 120, would you say 25%, and it looks the same as, as 30 frames per second as far as the smoothness of the images. Yeah. Whereas opposed to uh, what I did initially before I knew anything was if you film in 30 frames and then you slow it down in editing to... 50 or 25 percent it looks real choppy and like uh turn of the century silent film yeah exactly yeah so okay well one more question that's semi-related to youtube before we change topics i'd like to discuss time management and efficiency and the first question i have is are you still working a full-time job as an engineer uh yes i am still working a full-time job in medical device engineering Technically, I'm not an engineer anymore. I'm working more on the management side of things, but working with engineering projects pretty closely. So obviously, that that takes up a lot of my time. And as much as I like to say it's a full time job, in some weeks it's more than a full time job. So I think part of that, I think you probably see by the fact that, especially in the off season, I'm only putting up you know a video every month or every two three weeks or something like that, versus two or three a week. And that's just something I have to, to live with as part of the time that I have to manage. I also don't have any kids. If I had kids, that would put a little bit even more of a strain on trying to get consistent video content out. I think you see it more and more where if people are really trying to make the, the dive to content creation and really take it seriously, I think you're seeing more and more groups or even individuals get to a point where they're able to take a leap and, and sort of make that their main job. I, I think at one point that was very rare except for like the you know, most popular YouTubers in whatever genre. But you're starting to see more and more that uh, people are able to figure out a way to, to make that passion work. Uh, but for me, I, I don't really have any plans, at least in the short term, of leaving my job. And so it just means that I have to be a little bit more you know, careful about what I sign myself up for, how many videos I can consistently put out. I try not to just put out content just for the sake of putting content out. I like to have you know somewhat of a polished look when I make a video and so it just takes me a little bit more time and because of that I I try to make sure that hey you know hunting season I try to not have a whole lot else on my plate I'm not signing up to you know do any kind of uh, additional you know work or you know volunteer side jobs during the season so I can pretty much just make it work in, in hunting type stuff try and get as much done around the house as we can before the season starts um, so that really we can just maintain a more simple focus Whereas in the off season, when like, let's say at the summertime, you don't see as many videos coming out or maybe during the spring, uh, that's usually when I'm trying to get ahead of the game and tackle some more of those things that aren't specifically related to uh, hunting or video content. It's almost like you're clairvoyant, Garrett, because uh, my next question was, do you have any plans to completely move into outdoor content as your full-time gig? Why or why not? Sounds like why not is there any tipping point where you might reconsider or what would that look like for you? Or you're just comfortable. Um, I don't know if comfortable is right. The word. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it got to the point where like every cent of that was, was gone, you know, no mortgage, nothing to where there's very little debt risk. Uh, retirement was at a good spot. And I was at a point where YouTube was making a lot of money. I knew I could continue that momentum going and had other streams of revenue coming into through, you know, merchandise or, or whatever else, then I'd, I'd definitely consider it. But uh, not not quite at that place financially yet. Definitely very very risk averse when it comes to, to that sort of thing. Well, and that's what I was going to bring up, especially with hunting content and the way some of these platforms have uh, the inclination to censor that content. It's kind of a even more risky strategy. It's not like you're doing makeup tutorials or something where your risk of getting kicked off the platform are, are very low. Um, you could get right. he- heavily invested and then wake up the next day and find out you're all demonetized or banned. Yeah. Yeah. I would definitely say if anybody, you know, listening is looking to potentially do that, I would just say, you know, do your best to try and diversify those income streams. So you're not just relying on, on one egg in the basket. Yeah, for sure. Always sound advice, uh, diversification and kind of to close out this topic. So it's obvious to anyone that's paying attention, you're putting a lot of time, and effort into your content 
what strategies and you touched on some of them for sure like keeping your your uh focus more simple during the hunting season but is there anything specifically that you're, you're doing to use your time more efficiently and avoid burnout and maybe i'm some of the stuff might be obvious but like calendars planning um you know setting goals what are you doing to keep that focus and, and not burn out yeah i think it's really good if you especially if you have a planning type of personality to be able to try and put things on the calendar as much as possible you know if you're somebody that you know you're not going to be able to get something done unless you block off the time for it uh, that can be a very successful strategy uh, typically i would say for me it, it really just depends on, on what needs to be done and, and when um there's, I have the, I have the ability to cram pretty well. So if I know I, I need to just have something done by deadline, I can usually make it happen uh, without trying to, you know, micromanage my own time. But uh, there are definitely times where, you know, you just have to say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to make time for X, Y, Z on these days. And that's just what I'm doing during that time frame. Um, so like, let's say for instance, five years ago, I probably, have, you know, worked out more than I do now. Um, and that's just something I haven't made the time for, but if I wanted to try and add that back in in a much more consistent basis, then I'd probably have to remanage and relook at that time structure to make sure that I'm, you know, prioritizing that enough and eliminating whatever else needs to be taken care of. I mean, you think about it like a financial budget, it's not much different. You're just doing it with your time instead of your money. No, that's a really good point. And, and your effort goes where your priorities are generally. So if something is important to you or you're, or you're saying it's important, it, you have to reflect that with action, I think, and and make that a priority. Like you said, blocking out time or, or committing to doing it, whatever that takes. Yep. Okay. Well, no, appreciate the explanation there too, because I think that's something that I've read again and again and again on the, on the forums and online is I don't have time. I don't have time, but then, uh, this is me and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I look at someone like you that has a full-time demanding job that's still making time for content. I know you said you don't have kids, but as someone that's doing videos, I understand this stuff takes a lot of time. And then I look at somebody like Dan Infald, who's got a full-time job, the forum, the business, still making videos. It's like people have time. It's just how you allocate it and how you prioritize it. Yeah, there's a, a really good uh, story I had. I went to, there was a, a seminar put on by uh, Bobby Maximus. He was the guy who was the trainer who did the, they basically whipped everybody into shape for the movie 300. Okay. And he pulled just like somebody, you know, out of the crowd at, uh, at random to just run through this exercise where he has a whiteboard and he goes, you know, the common excuse to hear is people don't have enough time. So, uh, tell me what your obligations are every week. What do you do? Okay. You gotta work eight hours. You drive 45 minutes each way at that time, you know, this much time meal prep, this much time working out. And for what those true obligations were, maybe there's some, you know, take kids to, to school, drop them off, do whatever. Uh, but just about every scenario, you're usually left with like, you know, my activities only take, let's say 12 hours out of the day. So it's 24 hours in a day. So you're telling me you're on time. You know, it's like, what else are you doing? Well, sometimes I watch TV. Sometimes you do this, that, or the other thing. And so the kind of the point was, you know, once you actually wrote it out, it was like, oh, I actually do. Most people usually do have more time than they, they think. Yeah, it's kind of like when you sit down to do a, a monetary or, you know, financial budget and you realize, well, I have more money than I think and I'm wasting some of it. And I think time's yeah. the same way. Have more time than I think, but I'm probably wasting some of it. Right. And and I actually, I had a great professor in business school that one of the things that I'll always remember, and, and this is true too, he said, no one can sprint all the time. You know, you you have to waste some time. You can't just go a hundred percent all the time, every hour of the day. And it's important to keep that in mind also. Yep. I want to take one last break to mention hunting beast co-founded by the big buck serial killer himself, Dan Infault. hunting beast gear features state of the art manufacturing techniques, the highest quality materials and innovative designs that have been engineered field tested and refined to perfection by a group of the best mobile hunters on the planet. Hunting Beast Gear delivers cutting-edge products, including Beast Gear climbing sticks with weight reduction holes designed to deliver incredible durability in a lightweight stick. Beast Gear climbing sticks also feature non-staggered inline stacking and double steps, all in a 2.2-pound package, including the fastening strap. And new for the 2021 season, HuntingBeastGear.com has released the game-changing Beast Gear hang-on tree stand. 
Designed from the ground up to be the ultimate hang-on solution, with four years of prototyping, testing, and refinement, the Beast Gear stand features a 16-inch wide by 29-inch long platform and comes in at an incredible 6.8 pounds without compromising strength or durability. The Beast Gear stand is finished with a durable anodized coating and features grade 8 hardware and high-quality Delrin washers, Beast buttons, and adjustment knobs. For more details or to place your order today, head on over to www.huntingbeastgear.com. Okay, well, let's shift gears. From what I've seen on your videos and your content, I don't think most people would describe you as a diehard trophy hunter. It seems that you're more interested in the experience and the memories, which is refreshing to me personally in a, a genre or, I mean, sport, whatever you want to call hunting, that can be at times dominated by, by what I like to call horn porn. So... <laughs> So first, is my assessment accurate? Are you or are you not a diehard trophy hunter? I would say I'm more not a trophy hunter than am. I think there's, a, there's, probably, there's probably that spectrum for everybody, right? Like, who wouldn't want to shoot a big dog? But I'm, I'm definitely, I would say, higher priority on whatever the experience is than, you know, anything else. Yeah, and I, I think I fall into that same court category too, and, and you hit the nail on the head. Who wouldn't want to shoot a, bu a big buck? Sure, everybody wants to, but that's not my uh, primary or, or singular focus, or I wouldn't be shooting many animals at all. Right. I guess the second question on that, and this is more for people that are getting into hunting or maybe there's a you know slightly negative con connotation to some of this stuff and to set people on what I consider to be the right path, but you know, that's my subjective judgment. Anyways, how did you develop that hunting ethic where you prioritize, you know, the adventure, the experience over antlers when, when so many people are just obsessed with shooting a big buck? Uh, that's a good question. Probably something that you don't really think about at the time, but you look back at it after 10 years or so, and it just kind of morphs into that uh, just by the method of kind of what you're, you're choosing to do. I think for me, what I always saw as kind of a, a challenge uh, would be, you know, let's say I'm trying to figure out the that, you know, local public land or whatever. Well, maybe I start out in that challenge of just shooting the buck out there. Well, maybe that challenge after that for some people would be, okay, now I'm going to shoot, you know, I'm going to find and shoot a five-year-old. Uh, but for somebody else, maybe that challenge is, hey, I want to I go try an out-of-state hunt and test my skills and, you know, some new type of terrain or habitat and get to experience that that new, you know, way of maybe some strategy of hunting and you go out and you test your skills and you got, you know, four days that you're allocated with your PTO and, and that becomes your challenge. Or maybe it's picking up a traditional bow. I think everybody kind of looks for their own way to, you know, get whatever that experience is out of it. And I think for me, it's just been kind of a, you know, a mix. Uh, and it really just depends on, it's almost hunt specific uh, where some hunts I'm looking for one particular thing one particular goal. Other times it might be something else. A lot of times when I'm going on an out of state trip, for instance, the the goal that I have on the first time that I do whatever that trip is, whatever that time of year is, whatever that, you know, combination of circumstances is, you know, my, my real goals there, you know, hopefully to be successful, but to learn enough that when I go out there the second time in that same set of circumstances, I would have, have learned enough to, to feel like I'm going in with a high chance of success. And so the experience and the learning aspect then becomes, you know, pretty high priority for what I want to get out of it. And of course, meat is always a big priority for me too. And, and usually there's not a season that goes by that I don't at least put a couple of deer in the freezer. Uh, so yeah, it's just kind of been a, a mix. And there, there's been some places in, you know, let's say like Wisconsin where I feel like I've, you know, found areas that might have a lot of bigger deer and say, okay, well, maybe in this area, I want that to be my challenge where it might not be the same goal in a different state. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of great points there, and something that I def definitely related to was the go the first time just to learn, and I've hunted out of state quite a bit now as well, and I've got friends that are looking at doing their first hunts, or maybe they've hunted one state, and they'll ask me for advice now, and that's what I tell them, especially if you're hunting out of state, a new area, public land, is like, you're paying your dues. The first time you go, you're paying your dues, cover a bunch of ground, find out what works. Like you said, hopefully you're successful. But if you're not, when you come back the next year, you're not starting from square one. You're starting where you left off. You've got all that knowledge from the previous year, all those places that you learned. And, and things are never exactly the same. It's deer hunting, of course. But then you've got a, a really good foundation. And then it seems like, for me, the areas that I've hunted 
a third year is where it really starts to click. I mean, the second half of a second year trip usually goes pretty well, but the third year, it's, it seems like you hit the ground run and you're in the game a lot of times from day one. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, we've gone elk hunting maybe four times in just over the counter units in Colorado. I guess the first year is a rifle tag, but every season since has been archery. It seems like every year somebody would get an opportunity of our group. Uh, but this last year, it was like that was the year where for us, we felt like we we're actually in the game. Uh, whereas before it was kind of like, man, like if we play this right, we might see an elk. Whereas that, that fourth trip, if we felt like we knew enough about what was going on that we had a lot of confidence that, you know, it could be any day, it could be any moment that, you know, we had like two or three, I think, really close opportunities. So yeah, it definitely, definitely can take time if you especially don't live in that, that scenario. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, and you live in Minnesota, like Twin Cities, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay, so pretty similar, I would guess, habitat to what I was hunting in Michigan. You know, not exactly, but Midwestern. Wisconsin, Michigan, yeah. Pennsylvania, all kind of similar. And I know you hunt in Nebraska now, and I, I know you've hunted in North Dakota. That's a pretty big change because you get a lot less vegetation. Uh, you know, it's just a different environment. So the first year, there's there's definitely a pretty steep learning curve. Oh, for sure. Yeah, there's a steep learning curve on, on just the strategy of the hunt. And luckily, there's enough information out that if you listen to enough podcasts, watch enough videos, like you can get a pretty good idea of what's likely going to happen before you go out there. But that still is never a hundred percent what's going to end up being reality. And the biggest wild card is just what the hunting pressure is going to be. And so that's something you really can't predict. You might know there's going to be a lot of hunters and not a lot of hunters, but beyond that, it's really out of your control. Yeah. And speaking of hunting pressure, it looks like you and your wife had a successful early season hunt in Nebraska very recently. Just watched the video the other day. It also looks like you guys ran into a ton of hunting pressure, which I've also experienced on out-of-state hunts. So I'd like to know when that happens, what strategies do you guys use to adapt to the hunting pressure and keep the hunt going in a positive direction? Usually it's trying to figure out what you can do. Sometimes it's, it's doing something different than everybody else is doing, but sometimes it's just finding a spot that's been not hit by everybody else. And that could be a little bit easier said than done, especially because more and more guys are, are being mobile. And you might not, especially if you got dry conditions, you might not be able to tell that somebody hunted there yesterday because you can't, you know, you're not a deer, you can't smell that they had walked through. And there's not enough, you know, sign on the ground to really read those boot tracks. Whereas if you had like a ladder stand or a saw block, you find them, it's pretty obvious. And sometimes we'll run into that stuff in out-of-state trips too. Uh, but being able to see where other people are driving, other people are parking or constantly looking for, for driving into a spot, you know, is the fresh tire tracks. And when's the last time it rained? I mean, that can be helpful for looking for deer tracks, but also it gives you a really good idea for, you know, if it rained two days ago and there's this road is just littered with vehicle tracks and you know, it's getting really heavily used uh, versus if it's been, you know, dry and sandy and it looks like a heavy used road, like you can't glean quite as much information about how recent that was. So we just really try to, you know, talk to everybody too in the camp talk to locals, talk to out-of-staters, you know, strike up conversation at the gas station with, you know, guys wearing camo. And especially in the Nebraska trip, we, we talked to quite a few people because, I mean, you got a lot of downtime. You know, you're glassing in the morning and the evenings and you're, you're doing your hunts, but then you're still going into town to get gas, to, you know, get coffee, to do whatever. And just by chatting with people, we were able to learn quite a bit about, you know, what other people were doing, what other people were seeing in terms of either hunting pressure and or, you know, animal sightings, that sort of thing. So I think that was, that was a pretty helpful bit of information also. You know, we go to North Dakota, like there's a, a little bar that we would go to sometimes and just talking to the locals there, you'd usually pick up some pretty good bits of information also. So some of it is, is just, you know, socializing uh, as much as just keeping an eye out for hunts or sign in the woods as much as possible. And if you find that area where it's like, oh man, there's deer sign in here and there's no hunter sign, then that might be the goal line. That might be the challenge you know, of the trip it might not be necessarily figuring out what the deer are doing, but figuring out that one piece where they haven't been pressured enough to where they're going to move like they expect them to in daylight. Yeah. And that is a very similar approach to what I use on out of state hunts now. And it's just move, move, move. Like I pre-scout areas, I, I e-scout and I've have, you know, plans A through Z basically lined up and I'll try to hit what I think is the best looking uh, habitat off the bat if I haven't been to a new area before but 
I'll be real quick to move on if I see a bunch of hunter pressure or if I'm not seeing animals like I expect to see or minimal sign. And I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make, especially on the first time, is they cyber scout an area or two, and then they're very invested in those areas when and I think it's a much better approach to be less invested. Um, let the sign tell you if you should be there or not. And if there's a lot of hunter sign and not a lot of deer sign, or even if there's a lot of deer sign, if there's a lot of hunter sign, maybe move on. And like you said, find those greener pastures, because if you're willing to put in some miles and some, some boot leather, they're almost always out there. I'm not saying it's easy to find it, but, but they're out there. Yeah. I almost used to, on out of state hunts, even plan my access trail, plan the trail is going to fit in, plan everything before we even drove out there. And then, like you said, you'd be invested enough in that plan. It'd be really hard to deviate if the sign didn't look that great. It's like, oh, well, I'll give it a sit anyway. It could be good. Whereas now, I'm marking general areas. I'm like, oh, there's a lot of diversity here. This looks like it could hold a lot of deer. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of features that I could potentially set up on, and I'll just mark that area. And when I go in and spot check it when I'm there, it's like, okay, there's a lot of hunter sign. I'll go to the next one, plan Z for that day. And, and maybe if I find that good deer spot, then it's like, okay, now I think back more on the micro scale and figure out where exactly we're going to set up for this particular hunt. And that, that little shift in how we've been tackling that has, I think, made a difference. The other thing that I think is, has been somewhat helpful is, you know, each one of these trips where you have a slightly different habitat, slightly different terrain, you learn a little bit more about how deer use those specific habitats and terrains. And then if you're in a, a totally new area and that area is known for some certain type of habitat, let's say it's a river bottom area, let's say it's hill country, uh, swamp country, whatever. But then there's some little, you know, off the beaten trail spot that is not that same type of habitat, but it's something that's similar to what you've seen in, say, another state. Maybe it's hill country big, a little bit of swamp over in this region. Maybe it's, you know, sand hills, but you got a little bit of timber and a river bottom over in a different area. Well, if everybody's focusing on whatever the primary terrain type is for that region, because that's the reason they went to that in the first place on that type of habitat, you might be able to find stuff that's a little bit, uh, a little bit less pressured just by finding those, like, you know, something that's a little bit different. Well, that's a great tip too. Like you said, uh, people have a tendency to be drawn to, and, and that's one of the strategies I use actually when I'm going to a new state is I purposely look at like the, the record books and the trophy books and anything that's like a top two or three County. Um, even though there could be the potential for a really big buck in, in one of those counties, I actually avoid those because I think kind of the 80, 20 rule, right? Those top two or three counties are going to attract 80% of the non-residents. So I want to go to the one right below that. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, strategy for sure. And and when you look at those record books, you look at something like a Boone and Crockett list. I mean, let's say a given county has like 20 entries, which is quite a few for any, any given random county in the country. You think about how many hunters and how many deer get shot in that area. It's like a fraction, micro fraction of a percentage of deer that ever get that size. And a big one could show up anywhere. But you, like you said, it, it still is a very attractive point to, to people who are looking to use that as a planning tool. Yeah, exactly. And I'm at the stage for, for myself personally, where I'm still probably shooting every 130 plus deer I see. So I'm, I'm not looking for 170s, 180s, you know, I'll, I'll be happy going to that. Like I said, number two tier county, that's number four or five in the state doesn't get the pressure yep. and, and still has 130, 140 type deer. Right. Well, you kind of alluded to some of this too, but I'd like to know, um, and you talked about how your approach has evolved, but what have, what have been some of your biggest takeaways hunting new states? And specifically, I'd like to know how that's affected like your overall woodsmanship, because uh, obviously you're, when you're planning, you're relying on cyber scouting, but when you go on an out of state trip, you've got a much more condensed window. It's not like your home state where you've got the whole two month archery season. You know, like you said, you might have four days or seven days. So how has that helped your woodsmanship and, and what are you looking for? Um, sign specifically to let you know on an out-of-state hunt, maybe this is an area I should focus on. So what has really taught us to learn, I think, a lot is you can't just rely on the East County. It's a massive, you know, huge, important thing that you can do, I feel like, before you get out there to mark, you know, your plans A through Z. But, you know, when we really started to, I say we, that's either me or somebody else I'm going with, like Shane or, or perhaps, you know, Sam, if we're going out on a hunt together, you know, the thing that really seems to make as big of a difference as anything is 
that in the field, you know, in season scouting, once you get there and, and what you're seeing on the ground in terms of sign, in terms of hunter pressure, uh, in terms of what the, you know, actual true food source is that time of year. And a lot of times you might find that that e-scouting that you did beforehand is spot on and you get into an area and you show up at midnight and you get a couple hours of sleep and you crawl into a tree in the dark and it gets light and you have a deer walk by just like you planned. And there's other times where you almost have to throw the east scouting out the window because all the stuff you thought was going to be good is just loaded with hunter sign. You got to find something else. Or maybe the food source is totally different. You know, the first time we went out to North Dakota, we were like, okay, there's, there's soybeans, there's alfalfa. Like we're just going to drive around the fields the first couple of evenings and just see what we see for deer and find public that's close by. And by the time we had gotten out there, even with that super early opener, a lot of the beans had started to yellow. A lot of the fields were already being harvested. There wasn't any alfalfa. And that first night we drove for like three hours straight and I think saw one doe out in just these miles of open fields uh, with, you know, woodlots nearby. Well, what had happened was the deer had switched over to acorns by that time because the acorns had started dropping. So we had to kind of switch, you know, switch techniques and go into the woods and actually figure out, you know, where are some isolated oak trees that are, that are actually, you know, producing right now. Uh, get into the woods and just kind of listen. Okay, there's a tree that's dropping quite a bit over here. You look for the, okay, there's fresh droppings. Uh, maybe you walk a swamp edge that's secluded in a wood line and you find an open scrape. And it's like, oh man, a scrape in September, like this, this has got fresh tracks in it. Like, let's just set up right here. Like, that was kind of the story of that first North Dakota hunt that we did. And so the East Scouting, I think the spot that we, that we hunted, at least the one that I hunted, wasn't even something that we had originally looked at on the, the aerial photos, despite doing a lot of that beforehand kind of one of the things you had to learn on the fly and just kind of in general to go back to your original question the actual in the woods sign that we're reading is i mean that's been the biggest skill set that, we've, that i've had to really hone in order to try and you know maintain some level of success on those out-of-state trips yeah exactly and I th- obviously you know and people that that are doing it know and it doesn't have to be out of state in state whatever the more you do anything, generally, the better you get at it and you start noticing those details and going back to you driving around the fields for three hours and only seeing a doe. Um, I think sometimes that's just as important as as finding deer as, well, now you know a bunch of areas where the deer are not. And, you know, Dan talks about it or used to talk about it more on the forum about crossing out 95% of an area. And that's true, right? You just drove around a huge area and there's not deer there. Don't wish the deer to be there find out where they are you know where they're not now right and that's i think that's just a, a big key as anything else yeah absolutely i mean deer are creatures that edge so to a certain extent that's somewhat easy to do before you get there but there still can be a lot of edges in an area and a lot of potential bedding areas and a lot of potential food sources that you can verify but at least you got that starting point where you've eliminated 95 percent of the stuff and you're left to that 5%, which is still a lot, but it's a pretty much better starting place than what you had before. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, well, just to wrap up this topic, going back kind of what we discussed earlier with what you learned about YouTube, kind of a similar question here. If you were starting over now, going out on your out of first out of state hunt, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself? What have you found to be the one or two most really important things to, to give hope your success i'd say probably you know get as much as much type of local information as possible you know whether that's calling the the local game warden calling if there's like forestry service people um you might get good or bad information from that but at least it's information you can make a a scouting trip out there ahead of time and you're able to stop into you know the local bar hangout and maybe you know just chat with some of the people there like that type of information can be really helpful because it might give you insight to how the hunting pressure is going to be once you actually do that hunt. So I'd say if I got the opportunity to, to do that ahead of time, definitely take advantage of it. Uh, but then do as much e-scouting as possible, but keep it, keep it somewhat big. Don't, you know, spend an hour on one particular setup, figuring out exactly how I'm going to get in there. Uh, be more, I guess, generalized in terms of, this is a good, you know, quarter mile area. Here's another really good one over here. that has got a slightly different habitat type. Try and figure out, you know, three, four different habitat types if the area has it and be able to go in hopefully a day or two ahead of time and just spot check 
as much as possible. I used to be really afraid of spot checking stuff and getting my sense in before I would hunt a place. But if I'm not diving right into the exact tree that I'd be hunting, I'm just kind of doing a more peripheral speed scout to look for fresh sign and food sources. And that could be a much more productive way to spend the first day or two than to actually try and set up in a tree. And so that's kind of what I would probably tell myself if I was going on that first trip all over again. Yeah, and, and something that I've learned, and this might still sound crazy to a lot of people, is I'm willing to spend like up to 25% of my trip f- just scouting and finding deer. So if I'm on a 10 day trip, I'm willing to spend the first two and a half, three days to get into the right area. You know, or if I'm on a four day trip, I'm willing to sacrifice a whole day to do exactly what you said drive around, locate, do some speed scouting because you. You've got to be in the ballpark before you can be in the game, and it, it doesn't do you any good to waste time outside of the ballpark. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I guess that brings up another one for me is that if you got more time to spend there, plan on more time. Don't try and just assume you're going to be able to get it done in three, four days. You might get out there and you might spend a day trying to figure it out, and then you got a north wind, then you got a south wind. And it's like you know, you gotta, you can't just figure it out the first day and then have two good sits like you have to do every day on the fly almost it's a short trip like that yeah for sure and, and more time is always better and i think the only way you get away with a little bit less time is going back to what we talked about about maybe your third year right if you if you're yeah. going to a new area you probably want seven to ten days if you can swing it not everybody can swing that of course but then by the third year maybe you only need four or five and you know because you are in the game generally within the first day then as opposed to maybe it takes you three or four days to to figure it out the first year right right yeah and if there's like a, a state where it's like oh i know historically the hunting pressure is not that bad here and it's gonna be a rut trip and i'm just gonna sit in the funnel like it might be worth that drive to just sit there for two days because what else am i going to do and it's not really a whole lot of scouting going to be required because i know that you're going to use that place uh, you know unless something drastically changes when you get there but yeah especially like an earlier late season I, I mean, you need the time to figure it out it seems like for sure yep no, a lot of, a lot of great points there and appreciate your insight on, on all that stuff because I know more and more a lot of people are trying to travel and that's a topic people are interested in and someone that, like yourself that's got a lot of experience, you've got a lot of good insight on uh, trials and tribulations, you know, and growing pains, what's worked, what hasn't, so appreciate all that information. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I lied. One more semi-related to YouTube question. You recently released a video on your YouTube channel on stabilizers for bow hunting. And I got my current bow set up back in 2018. And along with the new bow, I made two major changes. The first was I switched from an index style trigger release to a thumb style release. And the second was I switched from a cheap short stabilizer, which was essentially vibration dampening to a 12 inch bee stinger with some weights on the end. And I read an article at the time and I've actually looked for it since and I can't find it, but it was a pretty in-depth, um, you know, with control groups and, and statistical sample sizes that were valid, you know, thousands of shots over a whole summer where, where two guys in one of the bigger bow hunting magazines talked about stabilizers and the effect on accuracy and, and it sold me. So I was like, well, I'm going to get a longer stabilizer and I'm going to run some weight. And between those two things, my accuracy uh, with the new bow, the new release and the stabilizer, they really went up. So if people haven't seen your video, can you discuss kind of what you did, your experiment and your findings with the, those stabilizers? Yeah. So, you know, with one of the main, I guess, advantages of a stabilizer setup being that you can get your bow to balance a little bit better. I went into this round of testing where I wanted to say, okay, if I keep that as an assumption that like whatever I'm going to do has a balanced bow, so my bubble level just sits, you know, perfect naturally. I want to try like three or four different configurations of stabilizers, compare it against no stabilization whatsoever, and take enough shots to where I can actually analyze the groups, analyze the actual stability of the bow with like an accelerometer, and then see if I can quantify for myself what the actual difference is. And so of those different groups that I shot, in just about every scenario, there was a you know, I guess statistically significant difference in how steady I was able to hold accelerometer wise, which is great. And I guess it makes sense. Uh, but then the actual in the field testing where I shot on a couple of different days and even the, the video was a little bit truncated. I shot more days and I had more data. So I wanted to keep it somewhat digestible. I would shoot these groups where I 
just would shoot ends of arrows until I had 12 shots in one group. And that gave me a, a good representation of what I was capable on that day with that setup and just collected all of the different data points and analyzed them with like the mean radius of the group size. And just like with the accelerometer data, I was able to show that in just about every case, all the different stabilizer setups I tried, I was able to get a noticeable improvement in group size and a noticeable you know, improvement in average shot distance from the center. Damn, I didn't have any stabilization whatsoever. And I think that was, you know, I guess in some regards to be expected, you know, how can a stabilizer not help just thinking of the physics of it? Um, so for me, it was more, you know, how much does it matter? Cause I think for a lot of guys, it's not a question of, is this thing going to help me? It's more a matter of, do I actually need it? Uh, and Tim Gillingham said something one time. He's he had kind of a good point. He's like, for, for guys hunting under 20 yards, you can get away with a lot, right? Like you don't need to have a, a full on target rig to shoot, you know, dime size accuracy sure. in order to kill a deer. Yeah. I call it minute of deer. You got to be minute of deer, which is about right, eight, exactly. eight, eight inches. Right. Right. But what I found anyway, is that trying to emulate some of the things that target guys are trying to do from an accuracy perspective, like it sounds like you did also, uh, and then try to figure out, you know, what, if any compromise you need to make and what's actually practical for the dial and method of hunting that you're doing. And then just finding a happy medium there made a lot of sense. So for me, I looked at the data and then I tried to see, okay, just practicality wise, is it going to hinder me, you know, a whole lot to use a, a front bar and a back bar setup? And generally it seemed like for most scenarios, the answer was no, I wasn't going to be that big of a deal. And it gave me an extra carry option for my bow that allows me to carry my bow a little bit more comfortably than just holding on to it the whole hunt uh, or the whole walk in. And so for me, the decision then became pretty easy. Like, okay, well, it's practically still working out fine for the way I hunt and I get the accuracy bonus. And it's not just an accuracy bonus when you're, you know, shooting in the backyard, but it's also a lot more calming when you're under high pressure, high heart rate with more mass and more moment of inertia that takes a lot more effort to pull you off target. So I think, especially if a guy gets pretty rattled, usually it's a good stabilization set up can definitely make a pretty big difference. Yeah. So I want to ask you two follow-up questions and this, this is for the layman, which includes myself, explain what the accelerometer is and what it was doing on the bow and how that helped your results. Sure. So accelerometers, they just tell you like how something moves in space. Like your phone probably has accelerometers in it. So when you move your phone in different directions, like if you're playing a certain app and you move your phone to the left, like something might happen, but your phone's got a piece of equipment inside of it that can tell when it moves in space. And so that accelerometer, when I mount it on the bow, it's a, it's a product that they make them for guns. They make them now for archery. It's called a Mantis, Mantis X8. I uh, mount that on the bow and then it just gathers that positional data. So it's just moving around in space. You're holding on target. And then when you shoot, it analyzes all that information and tells you exactly what your bow was doing. Like were you, you know, more moving left to right? Were you kind of moving up and down? And it gives you a stability score that just kind of tells you, you know, how stable in general that shot was on a scale of zero to 100. And so, on most of my unstabilized stuff, I get values from like 88 to 93. But on some of the best stabilized shots, I was getting values in like the 95, 96, sometimes even 97 range. And so it was a lot more stable just kind of looking at the numbers. And that was nice because I wouldn't have to necessarily go out into the range to do that to get that information in my garage. Okay. No, appreciate that explanation. And then uh, number two, because you are an engineer and you talked about uh, you mentioned moment of inertia, which I'm I'm kind of familiar with, but not intimately. Kind of explain generally, again in, in lay terms, if you can, how a stabilizer helps stabilize or slow down your float or helps your accuracy. What what's the physics behind that? You're basically trying to take weight, and that weight you know will help you hold more stable, just because uh, an object in rest tends to stay at rest, right? But then when you move that weight out away from your from your hand and not away from the bow, then it acts to keep your, your stuff more rotationally stable. So it's harder to twist one way or the other. So you think of like a tightrope walker and they have that really long pipe that they're hanging on to. And the longer that thing is, the more stable they're going to be, even though it might not weigh all that much. You know, like if you have a, a hammer that you're holding in your hand and then you, 
that the hammer weighs two pounds. Well, then you pick up a two by four that also weighs two pounds and you hold it out in front of you so that you're, you know, hanging that length way out there. Well, a two by four is going to feel a lot heavier because more of that weight is out away from your body. That's the you know, same kind of principle here. Uh, that the, the further you can get that weight out away from your bow, it's going to be harder to twist and move off target when it comes to archery. Perfect. Now, I appreciate that. And uh, I think that's probably going to be a good place to wrap it up today. We're, we're coming up on an hour. I want to say that I really appreciate your time. And Garrett, if people aren't already familiar with you, which I imagine a, a very wide portion of the audience that listens to this podcast will be, but if they're not for some reason, where can people find your content, uh, what social media platforms, and, and what's your uh, names there? Sure. So for the most part, pretty much everything is involved with the DIY Sportsman name. So if you search DIY Sportsman on YouTube, that's where the bulk of my content is going to be. And I'd say probably secondary to that is probably Instagram and uh, a podcast that I also run. So the Instagram handle is DIY underscore Sportsman. And then podcast-wise, I have the DIY Sportsman podcast, which is part of the larger Sportsman's Nation podcast network that Dan Johnson runs. So those would be probably the top three places to find stuff that I'm putting out on a fairly regular basis. If people haven't checked Garrett's stuff out, He's doing really interesting experiments a lot of time, great gear reviews. Your hunts are really well produced. So overall, just everything you're putting out, I think, is, is top-notch, good quality. So I've really enjoyed your content. Appreciate that. All right, Garrett. Well, uh, any last words? And if not, I want to thank you for, again, taking the time out of your schedule. I know you're busy like everybody else is, and I want to wish you good luck the rest of the season. No, same. You know, really good, uh, good conversation. Uh, it was a pleasure being on and getting to chat with you. And I uh, hope you had the you know, good luck with the rest of your season as well. Hey, appreciate it. All right, we'll catch you later. All right.